Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to leave as much time as possible for our um, exciting panelists. We've got um, five hot topics in HR from a legal perspective. Um, we're looking back, we're looking forward at the next year. Um, so each panelist, each, we've, we've divided up the topics. Each panelist will talk for five minutes on top of, we'll have a short alternative point of view, perhaps an opposing point of view, um, and then we'll leave some time for Q&A. Um, take notes if you like. There's a notepad in your um, uh, folders, and um, you could get extensive information about our panelists, as, uh, as we just learned um, in the handouts as, as, as well. There's also handouts on the topics that we're going to talk about today. All right, so our panelists first on the defendants, or sometimes the, uh, the rather the employers, sometimes the defendants side. Uh, we have Ron Green, a co-founder of Epstein, Becker and & Green, and founder of its National Labor and Employment Practice, and Betsy Plevin, partner in the Labor and Employment Law Department of Proskauer, and co-head of both the International Labor and Employment Group and the Class and Collective Action Group. On the employees plaintiff side, we have Wayne Outen, who's the founding and managing partner of Outen and Golden, one of the preeminent law firms representing employees. And Ann Vladek, a partner in the firm of Vladek, Waldman, Elias, and Engelhart, focusing on labor and civil rights cases. So, leading off, we've got our first topic is on the competition, competition for talent and post-employment restraints. Wayne is gonna lead off, and Ron is gonna make a brief response. So, Wayne, five minutes. Yes. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, looking at the roster of attendees, I notice that some of you are people I've dealt with in the past, and some of you are people I will deal with in the future across the table. Uh, and um, some of you may be future clients. Um, I, I uh, consider this kind of event uh, a Daniel in the lion's den occasion. Um, it's an opportunity for me to confront uh, those who are often on the other side. I hope to um, escape unscathed uh, from the meeting today, and I hope that maybe I might influence your behavior a little bit uh, from the perspective of someone who represents your employees. Um, the topic uh, is restrictive covenants. Uh, obviously, that encompasses a wide variety of things, as you all know, from your general uh, confidentiality uh, agreements and policies to non-solicitation of employees agreements, non-solicitation of clients and customers, and the strictest of all would be non-competition provisions. So I'm going to talk in a few minutes about that. Um, in good times and bad times, employers want to protect uh, their interest um, in confidential, proprietary, and trade secret information. Um, and one of the ways that employers undertake to do that is with these kinds of restrictive covenants. Uh, in good times and bad times, employees uh, want to be free to make a living. They want to be free to maximize their opportunities in the workforce. Um, and they want to have the opportunity to be mobile, if necessary. So obviously these interests of employers and employees uh, come into conflict in this area of restrictive covenants where employers are restricting employees. Empl employees, of course, don't want to be restricted. So uh, there's an obvious tension here. And my basic theme is that uh, you all, as representatives of employers, should be reasonable and moderate um, in the uh, uh, application of these kind of restrictive covenants for a number of reasons. Uh, one is it's good human resources policy. Um, companies that have overly broad, overly strict, um, not restrictive covenants um, uh, have uh, a morale problems sometimes. They have trouble attracting uh, necessarily the best of talent. Um, and certainly it causes conflict uh, at the time someone is uh, expected to sign an agreement and certainly at the time that somebody is uh, having to deal with the employer's efforts to enforce the agreement. So from a human resources point of view, uh, overly broad, overly restrictive, uh, non-competes present uh, basic uh, human resources problems. Also from a legal perspective, um, overly broad, overly restrictive, uh, non-competes, and especially uh, presents some real legal problems. Um, 
So I, I thought I would just read one sentence from a New York Court of Appeals decision which basically describes uh, the law, in New York at least, um, as you know, the law of restrictive covenants varies from state to state. Uh, California um, is, uh, it, it, in California, non-competes are essentially unenforceable for all practical purposes, except in a few situations, whereas in New York, uh, uh, non-competes are enforceable in limited circumstances. The New York Court of Appeals said, a restraint is reasonable only if, one, it is no greater than is required for the protection of the legitimate interest of the employer, Two, does not impose undue hardship on the employee. And three, is not injurious to the public. A non-compete agreement must be reasonably limited temporally and geographically. So there are three interested parties, the employer, um, and so the non-compete has to protect legitimate interest of the employer, the employee, there must not be undue hardship on the employee, and the public, uh, this must not be injurious to the public. So applying those uh, basic principles uh, in New York, a non-compete will be enforceable only if it is reasonable in time, scope, and geography. Uh, geography and time is fairly easy to understand. Um, and generally, uh, my view is that any non-compete that's more than a year is suspect. Um, but the scope is a part where I see a lot of serious problems where the overly broad uh, wording in non-competes uh, presents serious problems. So my basic advice to you is to be very careful first in deciding to whom you want to subject a non-compete agreement. Don't do sweeping uh, agreements across all business units, everybody signs it. Be targeted. Um, focus in on only those types of employees who need, <coughs> you feel legitimately you need a non-compete uh, to protect your legitimate interest in confidential, proprietary, or trade secret information. Be careful in the drafting so that it's not too sweeping in its language, uh, so it's focused in on the particular kind of business or business unit that's necessary. Third, when it comes time to negotiate it, be reasonable, uh, and fourth, when it comes time to enforce it, be reasonable. And the final point I would make, the New York Court of Appeals held, and this is a very important principle, that while it will blue pencil an agreement that is overbroad, that if the employer has not made a reasonable good faith effort to make it reasonable, the employer will, the, the court will not save the non-compete, but instead will just throw it out. It will not blue pencil an agreement if the employer didn't really try to make it reasonable. Thanks very much, Wayne. Uh, so do we have uh, an alternative viewpoint from Ron? I think we do. <laughs> <laughs> we have about 1,200,000 lawyers in this country, most of whom are practicing or trying to practice in private sector and look for ways to keep busy and make money. You just heard an explanation as to why that situation is not going to abate. That's because what is reasonable and moderate when someone's looking for a job, what's reasonable and moderate when someone wants to keep a job, what's reasonable and moderate when they're represented by counsel and negotiating an employment contract suddenly becomes neither when they think there's a better opportunity down the street. I was before New York State Supreme Court Justice recently trying to get a temporary restraining order because when these agreements are breached and the talent our clients work so hard to preserve decide to get up and leave, they're taking with them inevitably what they will use again, the proprietary data they learned only because they work for our client. They're often not going alone either. They may go alone now, they're going to come back and raid and breach the non-solicitation provision of your agreement. So we're talking about protecting information, we're talking about protecting others left behind initially, and keeping the person we negotiate in good faith to a specific term of an agreement. But looking back, when one personal situation changes, the corporate interests suddenly evaporate, leaving behind any moral commitment, let alone legal commitment, to the people who needed them to stay, whose jobs may have depended upon their staying, the clients who may leave because the group they had confidence in has suddenly been diluted. So we're talking about doing corporate harm. Here's a good example of it. 
just disrespect and disregard the agreement you negotiated in good faith, and then hope the employer can't carry the burden, the immense burden, of getting a temporary restraint on that departure. The cure in many cases, California as well, is not to put all your eggs in the basket of being able to enforce the agreement, because if you lose that first battle and don't get the immediate restraint you need, you probably lost the war. So instead of calling it a non-compete agreement, call it a notice provision. Negotiate for a period of time that someone owes you notice. If you're regulated, if you've got shareholders, investors, and others who depend upon the continuity of the process, force that employee to honor a notice provision. If you want to go, go. You want to work for rivals, go work for rivals. But you owe us notice, 90 days, 120 days. What that means is you have some continuity. You have time to replace, to bridge the gap, and to make the information that's suddenly so marketable to a rival, potentially, grow stale. Thank you very much. So uh, just a quick um, thought from England, where um, if an employer wants to bind its employees against competition after they've left, they have to pay for it. It's called garden leave. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll keep you from working elsewhere, but we'll pay you while you're sitting in your garden. Any thoughts on that? Really quick thoughts from one side or the other. Is that a solution? Well, um, we imported garden leave, or not we, the employer community uh, in the United States, um, maybe a decade or so ago. It's become fairly common practice on Wall Street to require people to uh, give notice um, and stay in the garden, tending their garden for 30, 60, 90 days. Uh, and generally speaking, that has been enforced. And generally speaking, that has been found not to be unreasonable. In most of these cases, the issue really isn't the departing employee. It's everything that the departing employee may influence. Client relationships, concerns of regulators, work teams. So if you make it possible to keep the employee for a while on guard and leave, we know you can't make the canary, the canary sing. We don't want the employee to really work. We don't want the employee to leave and go to a rival until we have a chance to shore up our position.